guided matrimonial disputes, legal framework for matrimonial disputes, legal framework for both. We're also going to touch some other angles from what she has, uh, you know, talked about. Now, when you're talking about matrimonia, it's something that has to do with marriage, a relationship between a husband and a wife. And then, if you are using the old Black Law Dictionary, from editions one to eight, it will tell you that marriage is the relationship between a male and female. But from ninth edition, it's telling you it's the relationship between two persons. Do you understand? Trying to bring the LGBTQ into the definition, but we are not bothered with that because that's not within the purview of our legal framework. So our legal framework has no provision for what same-sex marriage. There's no same-sex marriage. So when we're talking about the matrimonial dispute, mind you that that one is already what out of the way. All right. And what we're talking about this, this will simply means cause of action. Something that leads you to seek ventilation of your violated right. In other words, this union called marriage also confers on us some basic rights. That right may be right to the children, custody of the children. It may be also the right to what? To have a consummation of the marriage. The right to have your wife or your husband. They are rights. Okay? And that's why if a third party interjects or military intervenes, it gives you what? A cause of action. You also have the right to properties. When we talk about properties here, yeah, it's not just like uh, immovable properties. It also includes what? Movables, as well as what? Money. For instance, you're having a joint account with your husband, and then uh, maybe in the course of the time, you wanted to take the entire money, and he gets angry with you. Dispute arises. That dispute can be what? Can be ventilated in the court. Right. So, when we talk about matrimonial dispute, it's not you know, uh, limited to the act of divorce, no. You have divorce as one of them, you have um, separation, custody of the children, and then you can also have an action that is mandatory in nature. You understand? It's not everything that must lead to the division, scattering of the marriage. Ah, the man is not consummating, you go for an order, and the court makes a decree. And when he flouts it, he's what? In contempt of court. So, when we talk about this route, it is like an open-ended issue. It depends on what has arisen. So, it's not like when you talk about matrimonial dispute, you're saying it's divorce. No, it's not a exclusively divorce. So, we're going to look at the legal framework for matrimonial disputes. They include Matrimonial Causes Act 2004. It was uh, enacted in, in 1970, but has been revised, and we now call it Matrimonial Causes Act of 2004. We also have the Marriage Act. You know, this Marriage Act can be very bad to the DA or something, but right now, as our legal framework, we have what? Marriage Act of 2004. We also have the matrimonial causes rules, you know, just like the rules of court. This is the rule that actually applies to what that matrimonial causes act. And then, well, of course, we have case laws. We have case laws. You know, case laws are the authorities of our courts. Those are decisions that our courts have reached interpreting various sections of these laws or any of the laws. So that constitutes the amalgamation of the bundle called what case laws. Then we also have the English common law doctrines. English common law doctrines. You know, just like there are some basic things you may not find in these laws, but you can also find them what? In the doctrines, in the common law doctrines, English doctrines which are applicable as the situation warrants. They may be applicable as the situation warrants. And now the next thing is to find out 
when we talk about matrimonial causes, these two, who does it relate to? What is the purpose of this matrimonial cause? Who has the local standard? It simply means that that, that person who has been what? Married, either to a man or man to the woman. And that marriage must be what? Marriage under the act. In other words, we are talking about what kind of marriage? Monogamous marriage. As against what? Monogamous marriage. Now, at the end of this is the point that, talking about especially section 46 of the Marriage Act, it says that marriage under native law and custom. Marriage under native law and custom, or a person married, sorry, a person married under native law and custom cannot contract another marriage under the act. Cannot contract another marriage under the act, except with the same person to whom he is married to under the native law and custom. Did you understand that? Yes. So you don't see you where a man has already married three wives. You go there and say, well, I'm a lawyer. I'll go there and make him marry me under the act. Remember this very provision. We can also just oppose this thing with section 47 of the same act. Under section 47 of the act, no person married under the act, no person married under the act is allowed to remarry under native law and custom. No person married under the act is allowed to remarry under native law and custom. Whether or not it is the same person. See the reverse. Mm -hmm. So once married under the act, you cannot do what remarry. And at times you even begin to wonder whether that will be if at all be such need. Why would somebody want to be remarried again under another law, having already been married under an existing law? So for the other one, it says you can marry her if it is the same person. But for marriage under the act, reverse it, it says even if it is the same person, it is what a no-go area that that can just happen. And mind you that once somebody is married under the act, and the person marries another person, maybe under native law and custom, he cannot claim that he has married under native law and custom. What will he be doing? He will be committing an offense. And that offense is called what? Eh? Okay, bigger you, not bigger you. Bigger you. So, and the punishment is how many years? Five years. So it's as serious as that. And then we'll talk about jurisdiction, jurisdiction in uh, matrimonial causes. Jurisdiction. You know, we have studied jurisdiction, we talked about territorial jurisdiction, but in matrimonial dispute, this is a peculiar area where everywhere in Nigeria is what? Is the jurisdiction. Everywhere in the jurisdiction. So long as you are what domicile in Nigeria. So the law of domiciliation or the law of domicile simply means that that place I'm living, that place I'm staying, even if I'm not a citizen. Do you understand? You may be a Ghanaian, you're domiciled in Nigeria, you're bound by Nigerian law. That's what the law of domicile is talking about. So it's irrespective of the fact that you are not what? A citizen. And one domicile in Nigeria, it does not necessarily follow that you must maintain an action in the state where you are living. Right? You can sue anywhere in Nigeria. But the court has discretion to look at your suit and then apply what is called the law of forum convenience. The law of forum convenience. For convenience simply means that this person I have sued, maybe we are living in Asia, and I decide to go and sue you in Sokoto. And they say, because I know maybe you don't have the money, you may not even be able to come to Sokoto to defend the action. And the court will know that that action is predicated on what? Malice. 
And the question is, why not sue this person where the person is staying? So if the respondent raises the issue of forum convenience, the court and Sokoto may what do what? Transfer the matter to the state where both of you are resident. The idea is to ensure that the no party is overreached by that cause of action. Now, when we talk about domicile, the question that normally comes to mind is, where is the domicile of a deserted wife? Where is the place of domicile of a deserted wife? You know what that means when the husband has abandoned her and disappeared. So where do we say is the domicile of the deserted wife? The law is that the deserted wife has personal domicile where she was domiciled in Nigeria, where she was domiciled in Nigeria, either immediately before the marriage or immediately before the desertion, where she was domiciled, either immediately before the marriage or immediately before the desertion. Now, the meaning of this is this. If, for instance, a woman was living with a husband in Nigeria, and then the husband decides to desert her, and um, maybe she feels, okay, the brother says, okay, why don't you come to Canada? Forget that stupid man. And she travels to Canada. Where is her place of domicile? Is it Canada? No. Where she was domiciled, where? Either before the marriage or immediately before the desertion. I will now look at matrimonial disputes. What are those matrimonial disputes? So we can discuss them alongside with matrimonial reliefs. Disputes or reliefs. One, dissolution of marriage. Dissolution of marriage. So it can be a relief, it can as well be what? A dispute. When the issue is, look, you cannot compel me to continue living with you. I don't want to stay where I will die. The best I need you to do is to walk out of the marriage. So you're talking about dispute. There is a dispute. And in that dispute, you're also looking at what a relief. And that relief is what? Dissolution of marriage. Then another one is nullity of a voidable marriage. Nullity of a voidable marriage. Two things are together here. Nullity, voidable. We know what is nullity, what is not in existence. What is voidable? Not void. 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 I mean, one of the parties can proceed for it to be voided. What is voidable is what somebody has an option to either void or waive. So when you waive the right, you are what? You have made it what? Valid. You understand? But when you opt, to avoid it, as far as you're concerned, it becomes what? A nullity. Right. And then we also have nullity of a void marriage. So this one is like void ab initio. In the terms of voidable, let's say, for instance, somebody has married his cousin. And maybe by your jurisprudence, it is um, permissible but not morally okay. Right, that's law and morality now. Remember the students. Right? So if you decide to ignore the moral angle, you have done what? You have accepted it. Right? But it's a different thing where maybe it is clearly outlawed in the provision of the law. Statute really, you shall not marry your sister. And this person has married his sister. So that one has no remedy. So it's a different thing if it's a distant cousin. Maybe he said it was um, my great 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 grandfather that is related to your great 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 grandmother. Do you understand? It's this time. That one that may fall under what is what voidable. So it's circumstantial. It depends on the facts of the case. But what is void as an issue? The law has done what? And has no deed. So you don't even try to do that. And when we talk about void, what is void in marriage? Blood relationship consanguinity is one. And then another one is a situation where you don't have blood relationship. 
But that marriage is what is void. Can somebody give me an example? No blood relationship, but the marriage is void. Where? Beautiful. Beautiful. That is one. You are not related. But this person is what? Is a child. And by the child's right act, child's marriage is what? Is prohibited. Another example. If the person is already in an existing marriage, not again, where marriage is procured. Where marriage is procured, it could be by fraud, it could be through an unlawful means. Maybe sometimes somebody is already, just like she has given an example, I'll give you two examples, and somebody in their marriage, he said, instead of staying here, you're suffering, and the husband is not taking care of you, somebody comes in, you will help her to institute a divorce action so as to divorce her husband in order to do what to marry you. So if in the end the lead is blown, the title becomes what in knowledge. Because it's procured. Right. It's procured. So that is also one of the instances where marriage can be void and initial. So there are about five or six grounds under here, like we have generally discussed here. And then we also have judicial separation as a remedy and dispute, matrimonial dispute. Judicial separation. We know what judicial separation is. Yes. Now, the next one is maintenance. 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 You know, if, for instance, maybe the, the woman has become so big, and you are as a jingolo now, <laughs> so you, you would think the woman should be taking care of it. Well, you can try to go to court and ask the court to ask the woman to do what take care of you. Here yeah, that it sounds funny. Yeah. But go to the Western world, you yeah. see it's a kind of correct. Marriage is what is a contract between the two persons. Yeah. So if I have it, you enjoy it. I don't have it, you, you come on board. Right. So it's not one man's thing, one person's thing, that the person must die on that day, one day. Uh, so that is it. So better get that right now. Anybody can ask for maintenance. Because of your children. Because of your children. So this is another dispute. In good number of times, a party seeking custody of children has things he must strictly prove, he or she must strictly do what? To prove. Before we talk about what the court will consider, some of those things you must prove, you need a custody of the children. One is the bond. You need to, in your pleading, show that there is that bond, that such a bond that it will tear your heart or tear the heart of a child. For both of you to be done one, to be separated. You know, there are children like that. You understand? There are children who can't do without their father. They, you know, it all depends on human nature. And then again, you're going to state how you have been taking care of this very child. You know, care of the necessaries, that's the physical needs, as well as the words, emotional needs. If the child the kind of person that if he's crying and once he sees the dad, ah, he starts smiling. That's the bond. That's the bond. There are children like that. So those are some of the things you need to put down on paper. Those are some of the things. And then again, the necessary, uh, um, apart from school fees now, the necessary. I'm the one who notices when the stockings get torn. I'm the one who even notices when the fingernails start to grow. And I take the you know, those small, small things you think that are irrelevant. They matter a lot. They matter a lot. So you might be thinking in those big, big ones. No. And then what kind of game do your child play? Not to talk of men who don't even know the birthday of their child. <laughs> so you should be able to know. What games your child is in love with? And it's kind of the game PlayStation, this blah blah blah, you normally know, supply, bring around the children so that they 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 are they are at home when they have it, oh everything is okay. Right. And then also the discipline you instill. The discipline. Ah, the other spouse doesn't care, 
but me, I do my timetable, they have time to read, they have time to play. Those things are very, very necessary. And then, if for instance this woman is going away now from me, and the child is taken away from me, what will the child be missing from the one he's going out from? What will he be missing? His room, Chelsea color, or my new color, you know, which is in love with, the play tools and other that, that, that. Those things are very, very needful for you to put down on paper. Those are the things the child is going to miss. And then on the converse or the reverse, what is he going to meet where the mother is taking him to? Maybe the mother is taking him to a place where they don't even have such where there is no even light. He won't even watch cartoon. <laughs> you know all those things. So it's not easy for one to wake up and start claiming custody. You must satisfy the court. Right. And when you do it, the court will now strike a balance to know which of these things is in the best interest of the child. And the, the, maybe my Lord discovered that if the woman takes the child, the child will miss a lot. He said, okay, woman, don't worry. Your husband will keep him, but you'll be basically, you have access. You will have maybe a regular access to the child. Some of the times, come around, take them out to the park, come back, bring them back after two hours, three hours. And if you violate any of them, it becomes what content from the court. If the court has given you three hours, maintain it. And if the court has given you restraining orders, you don't need. And I did ask this question, if there are circumstances where, okay, for instance, let me put this and then I come to that. And then again, again, the age of the child is also important. You know, um, the age, the sex of the child, these things are very important. For instance, if the child is a female child, as we need the age where the mother is the one that can take care of certain things, definitely it goes to the woman. Sure. All that thing being equal. Right. But if this woman maybe is a, an addicted alcoholic, the court will say no. If this woman is maybe somebody who is an unrepentant adult, you know, adulterous human being, the court will also say no. Right. There are a lot of things the court will consider. We also have settlement of properties. Settlement of properties. So that we know the law we have here is that the law here is very liberal than the law in the Western world when it comes to properties. Right. Now, most at times, what the court will consider is that a woman comes into an already made home. Right. So she'll be entitled to what? To so maintenance. And then she doesn't talk about properties because there is no equity there. But what the House of Lords meant when they talked about the equity of the married woman is that those things brought when she has come in. You know, so women bring love. You know, maybe this man will have been surprised as soon as the woman comes in. The woman may not contribute anything, but bam, he has bought a house. He's done this, he's done that. She has what? An equity. And in distribution, you will consider what the equity of the woman is. The court may say, okay, we will do, maybe bring the equitable doctrine of conversion. Right. This property is for the maintenance of the other. In equity, in the rule of conversion, a property has to return to cash is seen as well as cash. Am I right? In equity. Right. The court can say, okay, sell this one to give us 60%. And if she can show what well, I was contributing to what she was doing, and the court will now say, okay, we can distribute this property this way or the other way. But in a situation where the entire property is owned by the man and so documented, the court will prefer to go by what? Maintenance. And what are times you, when they just this, like, the there are like two types of maintenance here now. If you're talking about separation, a separated woman is entitled to want to maintenance. A divorced woman is not entitled to maintenance. Why? Why? Why is she not entitled to maintenance? A divorced woman, the marriage has ended finally. Because it's now an empty shell. There's nothing to salvage. Right. But if she's separated, she's still the lawful wife of the man. 
And why in separation, if you don't do anything silly, the law will also catch up with him, her or him, as the case may be. Then we also have um, restriction of conjugal rights, like I said, some of these things you can go to court and say, this man is misbehaving. You know, uh, he comes out and tells me he's tired, and he drinks a lot, and then there will be that restraint no, that don't do the do that so that you can do what? Resume your conjugal rights. And the court gives you that order, that decree, restriction of conjugal rights. You must do what? You must obey. You just have to obey. And then you have dictation of marriage. Dictation. Dictation of the marriage is looked upon from two perspectives. The first perspective of dictation is stop the woman from falsely claiming to be my wife. Stop her from falsely claiming to be my wife. Like, stop, uh, stop her from parading herself. So that attention is that order that can stop you from parading yourself or stop you from answering the them. You can be answering your maiden name and still do what? Be parading. But that attention is not applicable to children of the marriage. There's also a case like that where a man is only son. But the son went ahead answering the name. The man went to court. And you know what the court of appeal said? The court of appeal told him that a man has a right to answer monkey as his son. Name. That if he's asking him Madubike does not mean it's your own Madubike. <laughs> right. I don't know which other Madubike man. <laughs> All right. So we'll look at the dissolution of marriage. We we'll have in the main talk about most of this in but. Just one, the dissolution of marriage. When can a marriage be dissolved? What is the reason for which a marriage could be dissolved? What is the reason? There is just one reason for dissolution of what? Marriage. Just one. But that one reason may have to drain. It's like a tree with branches. They understand? And that reason is simply what? That this marriage has broken down. It is and parties can no longer be expected to live together as what? Spouses and husband and wife. So that's the major reason. And then how do you prove that this marriage has broken down in between people? There are several ways of proving it. Several ways. One of the ways of proving it is omnibus grant, which is what? The conduct. That the spouse has conducted himself or herself in such a manner that no reasonable human being can expect me to put up with him or her as wife or husband. So when you talk about conduct, a lot of things can be conduct. One, from decided authorities, garrulous, troublesomeness. That the woman is a troublesome person. She is garrulous, she talks too much. You can never have your peace. But if she talks too much, why don't you try separation? Right? And that she bed weights. You know, I'm telling you facts. Ground that people have gone to court. And then the one other that she complains a lot. What is complaining now? What was for it? She nags. She nags. She nags. That she's a nagging. But you know, there are some men that also nag. So what comes under this ground can be anything at all. So long as it's something that you find intolerable, right? That thing that you find intolerable to you, you just can't go. Because this is a contract. A contract can be what? Can be ended. Right. So that's why the law has allowed this omnibus ground. And then some other basic statutory grounds are such as that the respondent has weakly and persistently refused to consummate the marriage. You know, some women do it as punishment. Some men also use it as what? Punishment. So it can be other way. <laughs> Did you say cow? Oh, wow. So it can be either ways. And um, it's a serious situation. But in a good number of times, you may bring a dissolution of marriage based on this. And the court will look at it as an association in a family court. And actually, do you think nothing can be done? And then move into counseling, especially the way it is done in Lagos. Right, move into counseling, or the court may now suggest 
after hearing both parties, possibly in chambers, the court will make any necessary order. So the court is not even bound in this regard to say, okay, want to pursue for divorce. But most of the time, the man said, I want divorce. You must ask, are you waiting for it to? <laughs> you understand? Uh -huh. So it's not like there's anything that too big or too difficult. Then, second one, that's in the marriage, the respondent has committed adultery and the petitioner finds it intolerable to live with the respondent. Two comments I have here. Petitioner, that uh, since the marriage, sorry, that the respondent has committed adultery and the petitioner finds it intolerable. Two or three things I want to talk about here. First of all, adultery. Adultery is a, a situation where who commits adultery? A woman. A man doesn't commit adultery. Another point here is that the respondent has committed adultery and that this petitioner has found it intolerable. Which means the petitioner is at liberty to do what? Tolerate. Mm. It simply means adultery is what? Pardonable. When you file a suit, one of the grounds to make your suit valid is to say that you have not condoned whatever you are complaining of. Do you understand? But in adultery, tolerance begins after three years. So for those who will say, hey, for five good years she has been conducting and committing adultery, the judge will be right now, that, 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 is that or you say yes? And my Lord will say you have done what you have waived your rights. If you want to learn the adultery, you want to learn you need to be first to the third year. So after three years, it becomes a statute. But since the marriage, the respondent has behaved in such a way that the petitioner cannot be expected to live with him or her. That's behavior. Right? But behavior here now has to be negative. It's a question of different strokes for different people. Right. Now the next one that the respondent had deserted petitioner for a continuous period of one year immediately precedes the presentation. You know, this rule simply means that if the marriage is still one year, you cannot do what? You cannot file an action for divorce. If some traditions is two years, you understand? But the fact that these grants talked about one year, it means that even if the marriage must have been one year plus, do you understand? So you must now show that after one year, before I brought this action, she deserted. Right. Then, if you prove that, that's okay. So I mean, that looks very easy. And then, closely related to that is that the parties to the marriage have lived apart. Living apart is different from one person deserting the other. And living apart here now will be living, living apart was negatively, not positively. Not living apart when you know that your spouse lived in the US and you are living here, but you are communicating and you visit them. Yeah, is that living apart? <laughs> but living apart, we are talking about here now, is the negative. The hostile living apart, right? She is living apart from you and it's not for any good purpose or intention. And it's actually for two years preceding the presentation of the petition. And that the respondent does not object to the decree being granted. You know, at times it can also happen like that. When spouses sit down to talk, they say, look, you know this thing can't work. Why don't we move our ways? On this other ground, that the parties to the marriage have been apart for a continuous period of three years, immediately present. Uh, immediately preceding the presentation of the petition. The other one is one year, this one is three years. So whichever one that falls within that is also okay. If, if any particular one is two years, you can bring it as under the one year, because it's more than one year. Simply couch it to say more than one year. That the other party to the marriage has for a period of less than one year failed to comply with the decree Restriction of conjugal right. If, for instance, the court has made an order, you know, ordering for restriction, restoration of conjugal right, and the other party refused, after one year, you can now do what? You, you ask to be relieved for you to go your own way. You understand? For the court to say do this and you say that I'm not doing it, means that 
everything is gone. Is that okay? And most of the time, the court will now say, what is the purpose for me to punish him for contempt of court? If he doesn't want, he doesn't want. So the best way to do was separate them, dissolve the marriage, let them go their own way. That the other party to the marriage has been absent from the petitioner for such a time and in such circumstances as to provide reasonable ground for presumption that he or she is dead. So normally, if, for instance, you have married this uh, away husband or away husband, and within a particular period of time, what is the presumption age? Seven years. Huh? Seven years. Seven years. Maybe I said seven years, no communication. But if he's communicating with you, can you come under this? You can come under what? He's communicating with you, but he doesn't want to come. He doesn't want to bring you over. He doesn't want to come home. And you want to be free. What do you do? You can bring it under what? Under condom. Under condom. Because if a man is here, you he can make all his talk sweet things. Do this for me. No. Come back now. No. I want a child. No. Is that not conduct? Yes. That you are finding what? Intolerable. So that's the thing. When you are, when a spouse is lying on um, adultery, the spouse must be able to do what? Name the co adulterer as a party to the suit. The co adulterer must be made a party to the suit. Now, um, let's also look at what constitutes nullity of a voidable marriage. Nullity of a voidable uh, marriage. That we can find under section 5, subsection 1 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. We say that the marriage is voidable. Where at the time of the marriage, listen, where at the time of the marriage, one, Either of the parties to the marriage is incapable of consummating the marriage. You know, maybe you, you people started as church people. But when uh, you have already rang the bell, saw the app and whatever, you discover that uh, Mr. Bed has been bed. Do you remember the case of Are Again Bed? Are Again Bedding? A criminal, or did you do it? The man that killed his wife under heat of passion, and the man. Raise the defense of um, serving or no, no, no. What do you, what the defense to manslaughter? Provocation. The man raised the defense of provocation. Can anybody see remember the facts of that case? Eh? They, they had this issue. They had this issue, this issue, but they didn't want to go for money. But the wife started taunting me. So and then uh, from the time, the man, woman was shouting, Hada, Hada, Hada. And the, the man fell. He felt disgrace and disrespected because he couldn't. <laughs> because he couldn't. So the woman now started mounting him, one blow, and she was gone. Yeah. Are against Benin. Now it's a very popular criminal case. Yes. If a marriage is like that, is what is valuable. Why is it valuable? It's valuable in the sense that because you love him so much, you still need to keep him. But you may look at our penalty. You can do the egg fertilization right, the IVF, and so on and so forth. But if you want to do that, good. But if you don't want to do that, it becomes what? Boy. That boy, they won't marry, it becomes what? Boy, as far as you are concerned, because you're not interested in the remedial option, okay? Right, then the second one, either of the parties to the marriage is of unsound mind or mentally defective. And mind you the rule of unsound mindedness. When somebody is said to be unsound mind, the person must be have been able to be a judge what a lunatic. Right. But if somebody who has his lucid moment, at his lucid moment he is what as good as you. Do you understand? And that period he can do what he can even enter into contract. Don't forget. That at this lucid moment, he has what? Contractual capacity. So if a man got married to a woman, because you, 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 the question is, how can somebody marry a mad man without a woman? Or how can a man marry a, woman, a mad woman without a woman? The person could be in the lucid moment. But in the course of time, you now discover that there is the lucid brand of him. 
and that you can't go. It becomes viable. You want to keep it or you want to move on, right? The same thing happens when the person is a, he is a mentally defective person. Mentally de de defect may not be perpetual, it may not be continuous. It may come in at intervals, right? It may be something that comes at intervals. So if A was deceived when the man was in his lucid moment, upon realizing A can do what? To go for the solution or decide to do what? To cope with it. Right, subject to recurrent attack, okay? Recurrent attacks of insanity or epilepsy. That somebody is subject to recurrent attack. Recurrent attacks of insanity or epilepsy. You know, you just consider and say, instead of me to start suffering from the one, why not I do what? Just move on. Epilepsy, now, I don't think it's still a serious problem now, right? Because there is this, um, there is this electric shock treatment that can sustain an epileptic uh, patient over five minutes. No attack over five years. You understand? But the, the danger is when the person starts getting like towards 40, 50, and it's not on regular treatment, the person is liable to be to have a stroke. So that's just the danger here. And that's why when you are said to marry such a person, first of all, find out the dangers. Find out if it's something you can cope with or something you can because in marriage, it's not something you do to please anybody. All right. Then, um, communicable diseases, if somebody who is suffering from... There are plenty of authorities, you know, you know, communicable diseases are treatable. But when you have somebody who is very unrepentant, you understand? You treat him today, tomorrow he has contracted an hour. The next one. So, the wife can say, no, 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 I'm done, I'm done. All right. Look at the exception. Section 35 of the Matrimonial Court Desire says that a petition for knowledge of marriage cannot be made by, listen, Section 35 FCA, a petition for knowledge of marriage cannot be made by, one, the party suffering from the incapacity. Why? Why now? Why can't the party suffer from it? Because the party may, during his recent moment, say, I, I don't want to punish this woman. Let her go. You understand? But the law says he cannot. So for me, I think the law is harsh here. I don't know what you think. Two, the person suffering from the disease or disability cannot do that. Or the wife under section one, subsection D. Subsection 51D above. So you find out what that says. If the wife is ignorant of that very fact, because why this exception is hitting the wife now is that if the wife went into the marriage with her full man made, it would be you know prejudicial for her to at the later point say I'm no longer interested but you don't want to allow her that idea that is why most of these most of these letters of the law they are subject to evaluation but if she can show that either she was deceived or she hadn't knowledge of the infirmity then the law can allow her to come under this exception under section 51d of the matrimonial courses act to ask for what for dissolution of marriage on the ground that the spouse is what incapacitated one way or the other as we have enumerated. Now let's also look at when marriage is void at the initial. You know, when I first started discussing marriage, I said the, there are several grounds, but the grounds under section three are where the parties is at the time of the marriage, lawfully married to some other person. We have talked about that. Two, the parties within the pro are pro within the prohibited degrees of consanguinity. So, if you have that consanguinity and your law does not prohibit it, it simply means that it's what is voidable. You can go ahead. 
But if the law had done what said, oh, this is your blood, you cannot marry the blood, then it becomes a void admission. When the marriage is not a valid one, under the less logic celebrationist, that is, if the law of the celebration where you are celebrating the marriage has voided your marriage, so you subject to the law prevailing within that very locality. The law could be, thou shalt not marry your cousin. You understand? Or thou shalt not marry your master's daughter. If, it, if that is the case, then it, it is what void of emission. It depends on what that law is. And then again, like uh, the person who talked about consent, lack of consent because either party is not, or when the consent is not real, when the consent is obtained by duress, by fraud, or by mistake of identity. By mistake of you see somebody just say that uh, his father is that with the ah, I say, Mom, if I don't marry this man, I will die. You have not even asked whether it is the language that says guru, or which of the languages. Then you also marry somebody who was incapable of understanding what she was doing. Prohibited degrees of marriage. There, there are some examples here. Uh, marriage of a man is prohibited if the woman is or has been his ancestress, wife, or mother. If the woman is his descendant, wife or grandmother, if the woman is his sister's wife, wait, sorry, the wife's sister or the wife's grandmother, if the, that's what you are seeing here, <laughs> if, the, if the wife is related to the father or related to his mother or related to his brother or to his sister, you know that one is possible. You can have a brother, you have a brother. And the person you are married is related to your half brother. So they fall within the no go area. But at times we begin to destroy these crazy Kenyans. A man, a woman marrying the son. <laughs> How can you marry your child? Let's even assume that the 14 year old or the 15 year old didn't know anything. Right? But how can you, as a woman who gave birth to him, marry him? You know? So, those kind of marriage, you need the, the civil society to take up the work. There are so many grants given here, but what is at the center of it is what blood relationship. Once you are related to anybody by blood, then definitely it falls under this.